Hey y'all, I'm Tim Cheatwood and welcome to my shop. Today we're going to make my version of the Paul Sellers wall clock and even do a little bit of carving on the sides. So come along and check it out. I picked up these boards from City Hardwoods in Birmingham, Alabama. They were in the shorts bin uh, for about two to four dollars a board. Usually that indicates that it was an off cut from somebody else's project and they didn't want it because it had cracks, checks and knots all throughout. But I like to take boards like that and try to make something beautiful out of what would normally just be thrown away. So I start out with my Stanley number no. five and uh, square up the edges. And then I move to my Stanley number no. four smoothing plane to give me a, a better surface to work with, you know, closer to my finished surfaces. Dimensioning the lumber is so important, it'll save you a lot of work later on in the project. In this project, I'm using stopped sliding dovetails instead of stopped dados, uh, just to give it that little extra something special. Plus, the stopped sliding dovetails is going to be a little bit stronger joint. Here, I'm just marking off the board um, that I'm going to use for the top and the bottom. You know, taking count of the uh, checks and the cracks at the end, definitely want to cut those off. And then I'm making some reference lines for the sides of the clock, uh, just so I have an idea of where I'm going. I start out by marking it out with the marking knife and then I go in with a chisel and chisel to that line from the waist side to create myself a knife wall and then go back and clean that up with the marking knife. Um, what that's going to do is it's going to give me a nicer finished cut off the saw. It's still not going to be ready to go, but it's going to be a lot less work later on. It, you know, it's going to give me a much nicer cut. So in this project, I used a few different saws. Here I'm using my Japanese style saw. It's really versatile. Um, it's got the cross cutting teeth on one side and then the rip cutting teeth on the other side. So you, you, if you have multiple cuts to make, you don't have to pick up multiple saws necessarily. Here I'm just marking out the depth of the dovetails with my marking gauge. I'm going to uh, just take that line all the way around the board and that lets me know where to stop. I'm going to go ahead and cut the stops in since I've got those bottom lines and I just chose about you know a quarter of the way into the board so that I'll, I'll have a little overhang and have that stop in there. As far as the distance is concerned you know you want a little bit more than half but you know there's not really outside of those guidelines there's not really a lot of rules for that I mean just whatever you prefer to do. And then I just rip down and cross cut over uh, to make the stop. I go back in and pair out with a chisel just to clean everything up, make sure it's flat. Next, I'm using my gent saw to cut down about between an eighth and a sixteenth of an inch for my dovetails. I'm going to do that on both sides of the board.
Next, I'm gonna take the chisel and I'm gonna start at the end of the board and I'm gonna aim it towards the bottom of the cut that I just made with my gent saw. That's gonna give me the angle of the dovetail. Now, I personally like to take a little bit off at a time so that you know I don't make a mistake um, you know, and work my way towards the end of the board. So I'll start just a little short of the end and, and then come back and clean that up. So once you chisel down to your line um, or close to it, you know, if you go a little bit deeper than what you've cut, these little uh, shavings will hang on. Um, you can usually just flick those away with your hand or just flick them towards the way that you're chiseling. Um, some of them, if you went a little too deep, will be, um, you know, there'll be some pieces that are left in there. I just go back and clean those up with a marking knife um, or you could use a chisel either way. Uh, to get those to release and really clean up your dovetails. You're just going to do the same thing that we did here on both sides of the dovetail and on both ends of the board so that the sides can slide into the top and into the bottom. It's the same process for each side and each end. Next, I'll take the dovetail and set it against the back edge of the top and the back edge of the bottom and just mark where the slot is going to be. And then I'm just going to take those lines that I transferred from my dovetails and run them to the end of the stop. And with the saw, you can cut, you know, about halfway through the width of the board. You know, you just want to cut down to the depth of the dovetail and wherever that stops, you can stop there. I mean, you can try to get a little bit closer if you'd like. Uh, you just don't want to go too deep or your dovetail slots are going to be oversized. Um, then I take the saw. Once I saw on both sides of the slot at an angle, the same angle as my dovetails, I'll cut a line straight down the middle and that'll help me remove some material with the chisel. A lot of people ask me about my joiner's mallet that I use. I mean, I use it for joining, I use it for carving. I use it for just about anything I can. Um, I actually picked that up from Maze Woodworking. Uh, Kenny made that for me. It's been a great tool and, and I, I use it regularly. It's one of my favorite tools. I'll leave a link to Maze Woodworking uh, down in the description below. If you haven't checked it out yet, you should definitely go check out his channel. He's really good at what he does. So I'm just chiseling out the slots for the dovetails, uh, you know, trying to keep that angle and you know, really just make sure that it conforms to the tail that I created. I always like to cut the tails first because it's much easier to clean up the slot 
and do minor adjustments to the tail rather than try to clean up the tail and go back and do minor adjustments to the slide. It just, it's easier for marking things out and for fitting. Um, it just makes more sense to me that way. So the same way that you do this slot, uh, you just do the same thing four times, you know, on either end of the top and either end of the bottom. And um, you just want to make sure you leave a little overhang on the ends, uh, you know, for, for the clock, you know, and also make sure that your, your slot has plenty of strength. Then I'm going to go ahead and take the top and the bottom and I'm going to shape it. I put it in the vise, use my Stanley number four to chamfer the side. Uh, chamfer both on the long grain side first. That'll help reduce the tear out on the end grain. And then I just do the same for the end grain. I'll, making sure that I keep the plane skewed so that it, it doesn't tear out or it at least reduces the amount of tear out. And then I can start fitting it together and it's almost starting to look like a clock. The first of many dry fits. Next, I'm going to start shaping the panel for the clock itself. Um, same thing that I did with the top and the bottom, except instead of rounding it over, I'm going to chamfer uh, just that front side and get it down to about a quarter of an inch or so. Uh, you know, for my slots that I'm going to cut in the sides in a little bit. Same thing, I start with the long grain side. That way when I go to chamfer the end grain side, I can reduce tear out because it's got more support. So the next step is going to be to cut the slots for the panel. Um, basically, just drawing a straight line, you know, inset on the sides a little bit. And then I come in with a router plane and uh, route that out. I usually go about a quarter inch deep, you know, between a quarter inch and a half inch. Next, I'm going to go ahead and mark the beading on the front with the mortise and gauge. You can do it with just a marking gauge and, you know, set it up on either side of the board. But it can be equidistant from each other or, you know, if you want them close together, I mean, it's your clock. You do it the way that you want to do it. Um, and that's what I love about this is there's a lot of creative liberty uh, when it comes to making these things. Even in commission work, you know, 
A lot of times people just come with an idea of what they want and they want you to put your own creativity into it. And, uh, and I love that. And then I widen the kerf. And I do that in both beads. So next I'm just going to chisel in to the kerf that I made. Um, really with these beads, you're, you're just wanting to create shadows. Um, creating those shadows gives a little bit more depth and it's a little bit more interesting to look at than just a flat panel, you know, on the, on the front of the clock. I take my gent saw and uh, go in and clean out some of the fibers that were you know, cut from the chisel. And then I'm going to use this uh, sandpaper to just smooth everything out inside and then roll it over so that I can round over the corners a little bit. It'll help me round the inside of the corners as well as the outside a little bit. And then I come back with my Stanley number four and just finish rounding off these corners, you know, just breaking the corner a little bit. I love these tiny little curls you get from that. And as promised, we're going to do some carving. So I got this template offline for free. I'm going to fix it to the sides with some spray adhesive. And all I did is I printed out the same template, uh, you know, just in four different orientations, really just two different orientations because I can manually flip them. And uh, that's going to you know, be the top and the bottom on each side. So you want to make sure that you really press the template on there and, and smooth it out. Make sure you don't have any uh, adhesive. You know, caked up under there and then allow it enough time to dry. If you don't allow it enough time to dry, then the template's going to move on you and it can throw your carving off. Once you start the carving, you want to hold the chisel at a steeper angle to get down to depth. And once you get down to the depth, you can lower the back of the chisel and uh, just carve straight through. What gets a little bit tricky are these curves and swirls. Um, if you haven't done any carving before, it can be really intimidating. You know, how in the world am I going to make a smooth line with this? Um, just try it. As long as you follow the lines pretty well, it's going to look great. And the more you do it, the more practice you get at it, the easier it is to follow those lines, to follow those curves. And then your circles don't look so much like octagons or <laughs> some other kind of angular geometric shape. So 
So when you start carving, um, it's really important to pay attention to grain direction. Uh, you'll see the more that you do it, that uh, grain direction does come into play on everything. Carving through the board, the grain changes on you and then all of a sudden you've got tear out or um, you've lifted up some fibers and it doesn't look good. As you continue to practice carving, you'll learn to read that grain a little bit better and, and see how it works together uh, to make those nice designs. It really makes a difference in your overall finished product. And once you've chiseled out all the lines, remove that template with a card scraper. I prefer my wood by right card scraper for this job. Next, I'm gonna go ahead and mark out where I wanna place the clock on the panel. So I get it where I want it. Then I just hold the clock with one hand and draw a circle around it with the other. I'm just going to set this panel up in the vise and uh, use my brace and bit to bore a hole through the inside of that circle that I just created. If you saw my last video, I think I did enough work with the coping saw on that purple heart box to last me for the rest of the year. So with the coping saw, you just want to saw close to your lines, uh, you know, not too far away because it'll give you more work to do when it comes to uh, shaping the inside of the hole and smoothing it out. Um, but you don't want to get so close to the lines that if you make a mistake that uh, it's going to just completely ruin your circle. Uh, you know, remember we drew the line around our clock, so it's going to be a pretty perfect fit. Um, if you get too big, then obviously the, the clock face would just slide right out. So then I file down to my lines, uh, taking care again, not to go outside of my line so the clock fits perfectly. Next, I use my Union 43 rabbit plane and I'm gonna start working on the finials. I'm just going down about a quarter of an inch to add a little bit of decoration and more depth to the finial. 
Now I actually used two pieces for the finial. You know, this is one solid piece that I'm cutting all the way around, um, or at least on three sides with my rabbit plane. On the second finial, you're just going to round it over like you did on the top and the bottom of the clock. Uh, start with a chamfer on both sides and then move your plane around the top uh, to give it that round over. But you can, there's all kinds of ways to do finials and to add decoration to your clock. So really make it your own. If you've got an idea, you know, this might look really nice or this might look good, uh, give it a shot. If it doesn't work out, you're just out a little bit of time and a little bit of lumber. Um, these are just the off cuts from the boards that I cut for the sides and the top and the bottom. Uh, so it's really scrap pieces of wood that I would have thrown away that I decided to add to the clock as decoration. So. Now it's time to glue up. I like to use uh, Gorilla Wood Glue for a lot of my projects. I'm going to go ahead and clamp up the clock housing. That's going to be the, the sides and the top and the bottom and the, and the panel for the front. And then I'm going to glue up my finials, my two pieces for the finials separately. Um, once the glue dries on both of those, I'll just go back and glue the clock and the finial together. It's important to mention I used way too much glue here. Uh, wasn't thinking at all. Had a lot of squeeze out, a lot of wasted glue, a lot of cleanup that I had to do. And you don't want to let it get down in the, the grooves on those beads that you created and all that good stuff. With my clocks, I like to add a back panel. I know a lot of people don't, they'll just leave the back open. Uh, me personally, I think it makes the clock look more complete as well as it's a really good hiding place. You know, you got some candy you don't want the kids to get or some money you don't want the spouse to know about. Hide it in the back of the clock. And so all I'm going to do is I'm going to set the, the back panel up on the clock and then uh, I'm going to judge the size and then I'm going to bring it to the vise and just plane it down to the right width. I want the back panel to be low enough to where it doesn't obstruct your ability to uh, get in there and change the clock battery or to adjust the time. So about halfway up the back, give or take, and then about, about a quarter of an inch into each side. Once I've got it sized, I just mark it out on the sides of the clock on the back. And that's gonna let me know where to put my recess.
I just chisel down uh, the same depth as the thickness of the panel. Again, on this, it's really important to consider grain direction so that you don't raise fibers unintentionally. Uh, on this one, <laughs> unfortunately, one of those knots sat right there where I needed to go, so I had to chisel through the knot. Now, that was pretty difficult. <laughs> but, you know, good sharp chisel and take your time and you can get down to where you need to go. This is a wall clock, so I'm going to go ahead and drill a hole for mounting. So all I do is uh, find the center of the back, um, both lengthwise and widthwise, and I'm going to put a mark there, and that's going to let me know where to, to drill my hole. and then it's back to the brace and bit. So I start out pretty much vertically to get the hole started. And then I'm just checking back and forth to make sure that I'm actually keeping it vertical. Then I'll take it to the vise and uh, angle it slightly towards the sky. Uh, you don't want to go too far in there because obviously you could come out the top or you could you know, weaken the top, etc. It's so much fun to use a brace in a bit. So I go a little bit slower to make sure I don't accidentally go through the top of my clock. <laughs> At this point, you definitely don't want to go that far. For finish, I like to use shellac and denatured alcohol. I just mix them one to one and uh, it creates a really thin coat of finish and it dries quickly. I start out with the front and I just pull from the wet edges and I work my way around the entire clock. By the time I get finished with putting the finish on the back of the clock, the front of the clock is dry enough to, to add additional finish. I love to see the way the grain pops with this walnut as soon as you put the finish on there. Now just dab the brush into the carving to make sure that the finish gets down in there. Once I've got all the finish on, I'll go ahead and add paste wax and uh, buff that in. And there you have it. If you like this video, please remember to hit that like button, smash subscribe and ring that bell so you don't miss out on any of my upcoming project videos. 
Also, please remember to follow me on Instagram at Cheatwood Creations. Well, that's all for now. See you guys in the next video.